Addiction is a medical condition. Treatment can help and recovery is possible. Addiction and recovery, tonight on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to the 22nd season of On Call with the Prairie Doc, medical information based on science built on trust. I'm Dr. Kelly Evans-Hullinger, your Prairie Doc host. Tonight, we will be discussing addiction and recovery. Thank you for joining us. In the studio this evening on the campus of South Dakota State University in Brookings is Dr. Vivek Anand from Averic Medical Group Behavioral Health, Sioux Falls and via Zoom, Dr. Stephen Tamang from Monument Health and Project Recovery in Rapid City. Welcome, doctors. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, so, Dr. Anand, can you tell us a little bit about your specialty, your path of training, and what you do in Sioux Falls? Yeah, so I'm an adult psychiatrist with specialization mm -hmm. in child psychiatry and addiction medicine. And uh, I am associate professor at the University of South Dakota in Sioux Falls. I manage a practice at Avera Behavioral Health Center Hospital. Mm -hmm. I have an inpatient uh, service uh, and an outpatient clinic. I also manage uh, addiction centers, uh, addiction center with Avera mm -hmm. in Sioux Falls and an adolescent addiction center uh, in Sioux Falls area. It's a lot of hats that you wear. Yes. <laughs> um, Dr. Tamang, you're out in Rapid City. Tell us a little bit about your path to uh, doing addiction medicine and what you do out there. Sure, so I'm a family physician. I've been in uh, Rapid City for about a decade and working for Monument uh, the entire time. I initially started as an ambulatory physician and then a few years into practice, it became quite clear that addiction was an unmet need here. And so <clears throat> I started doing quite a bit of that in my ambulatory practice and it became quite clear that uh, there needed to be a lot of connections with the community. So I ended up founding a company called Project Recovery which was meant to really just kind of have a startup mentality and focus specifically on the highest yield treatments, which opioids, thankfully, there are. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've had the great fortune of starting an addiction medicine service in the hospital at Monument and becoming board certified in addiction medicine through the process. So was this uh, the, the career that you had envisioned when you were in medical school 15 years, 20 years ago, or tell me? Did, oh yeah, this organic? planned it from, planned it from the start. <laughs> no, I uh, never would have thought of it. It yeah. was just patient driven. You know, mm -hmm. I, I encountered folks that needed help and there was no solution, especially when we started realizing that opioid addiction was having a huge mortality effect, mm -hmm. even in our little community, and that the evidence-based treatment for it was just not available. Mm -hmm. it, it became abundantly clear that doing a uh, relatively small amount of work had a giant effect, not only on patients' quality of life, but actually saved a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. And so being a person who likes to get the highest yield uh, out of minimal effort, it was a very natural uh, transition to treating opioids and then it, it's, became apparent we had a meth problem and so mm -hmm. we uh, employed all available tools to try to help with stimulant use disorder as well. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, it, it was a, definitely a, a, something that was picked up because of the need seen from the patients in the ambulatory setting. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, but before we start our conversation, we invite you, our audience, to submit your questions for tonight's discussion about addiction and recovery. Viewers can contact us three ways. Call 1-888-376-6225, send an email to ask at prairiedoc.org or ask on our Prairie Doc Facebook page. We will work to answer as many of your questions as possible given the time available. Sometimes we receive more questions than we can cover and we apologize if we do not get to your question. To encourage you to ask early, all questions asked in the first 20 minutes will be entered into a drawing for our newest Prairie Doc publication. The winner will be announced at the end of this program. Your question will remain anonymous, but please provide contact information if you would like to be eligible for the prize. Um, I'd, I'd like to start, there's, there's a lot of sort of crossover in terms we use and how we use them medically versus maybe how they're interpreted by our viewers. So, Let's start, what do we mean when we say addiction? How is addiction different from other ways that people maybe use substances that we're gonna to talk to about tonight, Dr. Yeah, so addiction has a couple of hallmark features like lack of control and compulsive behaviors that mm -hmm. you know uh, you have to use a substance 
in order to feel better. Mm -hmm. And folks usually start from experimentation and you know, recreational use and over time it just solidifies and starts causing problems in various aspects of people's lives, mm -hmm. eventually impacting their occupational lives, you know, social lives, recreational lives, interpersonal lives, causing psychological impacts, causing physical harms. Mm -hmm. And then they realize that they have gotten tolerance to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are able to tolerate large amounts of uh, whatever substance they are using over time. And, uh, and then there's this, always this wish to stop. And mm -hmm. when they do, uh, they get into withdrawal. Mm -hmm. uh, and the withdrawal sort of, you know, keeps the cycle sort of moving. Mm -hmm. And they withdraw and then they use again and, you know, and then there's compulsive behaviors that you cannot get rid of. And that is what a substance use disorder or addiction in layman terms. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, great. And so, um, tell like in your practice in Sioux Falls, what's the most common substance use disorder? What's what substance is the most commonly used that you end up treating people for? Right. So in Sioux Falls area at the Avera Center, uh, at the addiction center, we see a lot of alcohol. Mm -hmm. So I would say you know 90, 95 percent of alcohol users, uh, followed by uh, methamphetamine uh, and you know opioid use um, mm -hmm. disorder that we see there. Yeah. In the outpatient clinic, however, it just seems to be a good mix of uh, opioids and. Uh, uh, an alcohol use disorder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and and Dr. Tamang, you mentioned opioids as a big focus of the project recovery um, clinic that you do. You know, opioids are unique because you know, of course, all substances can be deadly. We see a lot of death from right. alcohol, but opioids are uniquely deadly. For our viewers, why is that? Why? How? How do opioids kill your patients? Yeah, so there's two particular things to be aware of with opioid addiction. As the first, as you pointed out, when you take it in high quantities, you cause respiratory depression, and, it can, and that can be a, an obviously a fatal thing. It stops your heart, stops you from breathing, and, and it's a very dose-dependent. The lethality of it is quite significant, and that is in contrast to methamphetamines, for example, um, which higher doses can certainly be harmful, but the lethality is much lower. Mm -hmm. The second really important aspect to opioids is we have evidence-based treatment that is far more effective at keeping people free of uh, relapse mm -hmm. um, compared to the other um, classic addictions such as stimulants uh, or alcohol. Mm -hmm. And just, I have to back up to what's an opioid? So like name some commonly used opioids that our viewers may have heard of. Sure. So I think classically people think of pain pills like mm -hmm. morphine, or if you go to the dentist, you get Tylenol with codeine, th things of this nature. And then um, what people might not correlate is there's certainly illicit opioids. Uh, people buy illicit fentanyl, for example, mm -hmm. or heroin. Those are uh, you know considered like street drugs or whatnot. Um, and so the prevalence of those. Um, is, is quite significant, and, and we also have um, a modality in the street called Narcan. I'm sure you've heard of that mm -hmm. as well, where it's like the reversal of this. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another thing to keep in mind when you when you consider street um, drugs or, or heroin. Mm -hmm. Good. And we see, we see, I bet our viewers see a lot about fentanyl in the media. Some of it's very scary. Mm -hmm. So what's fentanyl? Why is it problematic, and, and why do we see so much about it in the media? Yeah. So fentanyl has become like the uh, the newest wave of um, mortality related to opioid use. Mm -hmm. So the, there's historically, you know, we talk about three waves of uh, mortality and morbidity. You know, initially it was the prescription medications, and then uh, you know uh, all physicians became very regulated, you know, very uh, cognizant of it, and that's when the heroin uh, mm -hmm. rise happened. And after that, the synthetic fentanyl, and we struggle with that all the time. So fentanyl is an opioid. Mm -hmm. It's a very potent uh, opioid, and uh, it is being the kind of fentanyl that's harmful or that's you know causing all the mortality is the illegally synthesized mm -hmm. uh, fentanyl, uh, which is available rampantly uh, across uh, Sioux Falls. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, you know, because fentanyl's in the mm -hmm. media so much, but fentanyl is also a medically used. Absolutely. Um, Opioid, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's used, you know, probably if you've had a procedure, a colonoscopy, in right. an operating room recently, you might have gotten fentanyl. And I've I've had patients actually come back to me after a procedure just 
very angry that they were given fentanyl. So I, I think sometimes there is some misinformation out there. Um, yes. You know, you, you might get this in yes. a medically controlled setting yes. for good reason, yes. right? But most people who are dying from using fentanyl are not using right. prescription fentanyl. It's just that uh, they are scared of uh, that. It, mm -hmm. and, and another analogy would be, you know, methamphetamine is a FDA approved treatment for ADHD. Mm -hmm. But when methamphetamine became illegal, now it has gotten uh, stigmatized. And right. any methamphetamine is bad. Mm -hmm. And same thing with fentanyl. So most folks who are, uh, who are you know, struggling and, and dying uh, are just, you know, illegally um, manufactured fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are not patches. These are actually right. tablets that they are smoking off of an aluminum foil mm -hmm. uh, and so they're inhaling and that's like a fast onset of action uh, leading to you know respiratory uh, depression and bradycardia and eventually causing death. Mm -hmm. um, yeah good and I, I think in our part of the country our part of the world we maybe don't we don't it, substance use disorders and especially opioid use disorders aren't particularly visible but Stephen you talked about the great need for treatment in your part of the state. So th this obviously is more common than probably we realize day to day. Can you speak about that a little bit, how common it is? Yeah, you know, it's funny when I first started practicing, um, I'd never really heard about heroin or um, had any significant training in it. But as soon as you step into the space um, and patients have good outcomes, um, you get a lot of people seeking care and mm -hmm. especially when you become you know an addiction medicine physician and there just aren't that many of us um, you become aware that it's a problem that an awful lot of people have and it's just not built in society from an infrastructural standpoint uh, to care for it plus of course it's marred with stigma and shame mm -hmm. and so um, as you alluded to earlier it really is a brain chemistry disease that causes a physiological addiction. And for any other equivalent disease, we would treat it with compassion. We would advertise that we care for it. We would support people through their struggles. But many folks, when it comes to addiction, the stigma of it is so severe that the shame keeps them from coming forward to get help. Mm -hmm. And so thankfully, um, in 2024, 2023, we're seeing a shift. There's, there's more acceptance to understand that, hey, this isn't a character deficit. Mm -hmm. This is a disease that maybe came about from some, some behavioral methods, or maybe it became about because you were prescribed too many opioids and for a very legitimate reason, um, or you had a lapse of judgment initially, but you would do anything now to not have an mm -hmm. addiction. And so thankfully, we're getting to a point as a society where I think we are starting to treat it more like the disease that it truly is. Right, and that is a great point. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, all sort of substance use disorders uh, uh, lead to functional and structural changes in the brain. Mm -hmm. so it's a brain-based disease, mm -hmm. and we ought to be treating it like that and not a moral flaw or a character defect. Yeah, it's challenging yeah. because it really does affect, you know, a very human part of us, which is yes. different from some other medical disorders. So I think it's, that that's a challenging thing, but we've learned a lot over the last 10 or 20 years about Absolutely. that. We're getting some great viewer questions, so I'm gonna to go to some of those here. Um, we had a caller who asked, can someone be genetically predisposed to addiction? So David, what, what would you say about that? What do we know yeah, about so, the genetics of so, these disorders? So certainly there's a genetic transmission aspect from one generation to another, and that is the heritability has pointed uh, with a point estimate of anywhere from 40 to 60 percent. Mm. So uh, if, there's a, if there's a family history of substance use disorders, uh, there is a genetic transmission of that risk. However, being at risk does not mean that you are going to develop the disease mm -hmm. uh, if you partake in prevention programs and you, know, you are cognizant of that, uh, it certainly can be avoided. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, Let's see, we had a question about methadone actually. So mm -hmm. what is methadone, Stephen, and what, what's your opinion on the use of it? And we can talk about, we have probably other treatments, alternatives to methadone, but what is methadone? Yeah, so for people who suffer from opioid use disorder, or that's just addiction mm -hmm. to opioids, there's, I would say there's three FDA approved treatments, but I'd say two are, are commonly used. One mm -hmm. is methadone, the other is buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. And methadone is in and of itself an opioid. Mm -hmm. um, and it has a few unique characteristics that make it um, advantageous to treat folks with addiction. The biggest one is it has a very long <clears throat> half-life. And that just means 
when you take it, you are free from cravings, you know, f for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And when taken on appropriate schedule and an appropriate dose, the patient is able to, to go about their life, maintain their obligations, and, and in many um, situations, uh, you know, have their disease under control. Um, methadone is, I would say, historically was the primary treatment. Mm -hmm. um, trends are really shifting more towards buprenorphine now, which is commonly called Suboxone, or some people call it bupes. And that's just, um, it's a partial opioid agonist, so it acts a lot like methadone, but it has a much safer profile. It's um, it's virtually um, realistically um, not something you can o OD on, and it, it also has the benefit of reducing cravings that cause people to relapse. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, so one of um, one of the things about methadone is that it can only be uh, dispersed from a federally certified mm -hmm. opioid treatment program center, right. and which makes it uh, which is a barrier. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know. Uh, when I trained in Carolina, we used to, you know, be at the OTP center, and uh, folks would be in a line at like 4:30 right. a.m., 5 a.m., and then, you know, they have to be there every day. You know, mm -hmm. after that, just wait for a while just to monitor them for any toxicity mm -hmm. uh, or side effects, and then they would go. So that was a barrier as far as right. employment. Uh, you know, being there on time. You know, if there's a transportation issue, then there'll be a problem. So there's a lot of regulatory mm -hmm. uh, barriers around methadone. Mm -hmm. Suboxone, like Dr. Meng said is 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 lately that's where the, the trend is shifting because it's uh, it's effective is efficacious uh, in some cases you know is as good as methadone mm -hmm. now having said that methadone does have its place you know mm -hmm. particularly with IV drug users and sure. uh, and you know th uh, where buprenorphine does not uh, help them out as expected yeah Great. Yeah, I can recall I trained in Denver, Colorado, mm -hmm. and um, at our county hospital, sometimes you might admit a patient for pneumonia, mm -hmm. but they if they were a methadone clinic patient, you had to jump through a lot of hoops on yeah. a Saturday morning to make sure that they got their methadone and um, did the things they need to, to do yeah. to stay part of that clinic. Okay. But great questions. In 2022, over 73,000 people in the United States died from a fentanyl overdose. One foundation born from this tragedy is trying to help this epidemic in South Dakota and surrounding states. Prairie Doc reporter Sam Schauer shares the story of Emily's Hope. Emily's Hope is a foundation started by former TV reporter and anchor Angela Kennecke. In 2018, Kennecke lost her daughter Emily to fentanyl poisoning. It's killing a record number of people. It's the number one leading cause of death for people 18 to 45. And I thought whatever I could do with the platform I had on television, um, I was gonna do. I was gonna do whatever I could do to try to save lives. And that's how Emily's Hope was born. Officially starting in 2019, Emily's Hope's mission is to help people get through treatment and help pay whatever bills they can for the patient. So we pay for their deductible. We might pay their rent if they're gonna be going into treatment for 30 days or some outstanding bills. Just anything we can do to take away the barrier that prohibits people from going into treatment in the first place. Kennecke says since that starting mission goal, they've raised over $400,000 and have helped over 200 people get through treatment. To help send the message of Emily's Hope, Kennecke has traveled all over the country to share her daughter's story. I've brought Emily's story to 18,000 students across the country and of course across the region, high school students, grades seven through 12. And I think that's also making a big impact, a big difference among students. Kennecke has also started an Emily's Hope curriculum that teaches students about the dangers of drug use and fentanyl. She says her curriculum isn't meant to scare students away from drug use, but to teach and have conversations with them about drug use. Studies show that curriculums that try to scare children or just use testimonials didn't work. So we're talking to kids in very age appropriate, relatable ways. We have an animation series, we have children's books, and the lessons build upon them. Emily's Hope's curriculum is offered to all schools who wish to use it. And Kennecke says expansion is on the horizon with new education programs and giving fentanyl testing strips to everyone. We've given those to shelters, to halfway houses, to bars and music festivals. And I'm in the process of ordering Narcan now that it's over the counter. We're getting some funding for that right now. Sharing the tragic loss of her daughter has pushed Kennecke to make sure families never feel the pain she felt.
And she couldn't be prouder of what's been done to honor Emily's life. We're going to do whatever we can to raise awareness about fentanyl, about the overdose crisis, and to help people in any way we can. Thanks to Angela for helping us with that segment. And Vivek, you mentioned you've worked with Angela on some of these education programs, trying to do evidence-based things in right. local schools. Yeah, yeah, so we actually helped design this curriculum mm -hmm. uh, along with Emily's Hope, uh, and Angela is a part of it. She's the founder of mm -hmm. it. And then, you know, so we introduced this curriculum into third graders. And this is uh, teaching them about their body functions, their emotions, you know, how to cope with things. And uh, essentially, you know, pause, think, and act, which is, you know, our mm -hmm. um, our sort of slogan for for Emily's Hope, you know, in the curriculum. So, mm -hmm. you know, th stop, think about it, make a decision, and then act on it. And this is all based on uh, education and awareness, starting at third grade level, mm -hmm. and hoping that they will carry on the gains and into middle school and high school years and then prevent any recreational use uh, and thereby stopping any substance use. Yeah, great. I am of the generation and apparently we, we heard um, in before the show of that did D.A.R.E. and I think mm -hmm. D.A.R.E. still goes on. Did you do D.A.R.E. Stephen in school? Is that familiar oh, yes. too? Yeah. Oh, yep. So this is different, right? Is, yeah. How is it different from what we'd be familiar with? Yeah, so D.A.R.E. Dare is more like, you know, do not do drugs, uh, mm -hmm. say no to drugs and uh, uh, but this is so different, you know, this is about education, awareness, and at a much younger level in elementary school years. So, you know, uh, kids are able to learn about how their brain functions, how these substances can impact your mm -hmm. brain, and how that will cause problems uh, later on in their lives. So this is very much awareness and prevention focused that way. Great. Um, we're getting some some more great questions. I the one thing that I wanted to follow up on was naloxone, which was mentioned here. So naloxone or Narcan, you mentioned it as a opioid sort of antidote, if you will, Stephen. Who and it, it's available over the counter now, which is relatively new, um, at least in in South Dakota. Who who should carry naloxone? How is it used? Like, what are your thoughts on that? It's a absolute life-saving drug because when a person overdoses on opioids, it's essentially the only tool that will save them from from expiring. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in our community, um, you know, any treatment center and most hospitals will will disperse it. Um, many of the pharmacies, as you mentioned, have um, provider agreements where they can dispense it based on, on their judgment. And of mm -hmm. course, uh, EMS workers and many law enforcement mm -hmm. people carry it. And what's interesting, and people might not be aware of it, is there's a, fair, a fairly large number of uh, patients who um, abuse opioids um, and they're aware of the danger, and so they actually carry it to save their friends. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're aware, it's almost like um, they have it as a safety net just in case they have a relapse or one of their friends has a relapse. So we encourage anyone that's on a fairly large amount of prescription opioids to carry it, or anyone that has any reasonable risk of relapse or knows someone who has mm -hmm. a reasonable risk of relapse. You know, your family should carry it if you have a family member, because mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to administer and it, um, it, it saves their life. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great lifesaver, you know, and that is proven by a lot of, uh, lot of research. Uh, it was actually first trialed in San Francisco and when Narcan mm -hmm. was uh, mm -hmm. distributed and given out and used, uh, the death rate just fell off, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it has been such a lifesaver. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, really That's not a downside. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll get to some viewer questions. We had a question, um, a caller who asked, how do you treat meth addiction or amphetamine addiction? Right. So meth methamphetamine use disorder, so again, um, people usually start using meth just to be more active mm. uh, and, you know, be more functional. I have had businessmen uh, and, you know, mm. other people who are very, like, functional in their lives using methamphetamine, and that's how it starts, you know, farmers, mm. truck drivers, and, and then over time it causes, you know, structural changes in your brain, and then uh, you are hooked onto it. Uh, you withdraw uh, when you stop it. I mean, you know, people get sad. Uh, they get, uh, you know, they uh, they just want to sleep. They get very tired. 
But as far as you know, their treatment, the, the treatment options are very few. So there's one trial that was uh, published looking at you know, a couple of medications, a combination trial uh, of you know, a medication called Wellbutrin and naltrexone injection. Mm -hmm. And that was found to have some efficacy in the range of you know, 13 to 15%. Uh, which was uh, which was much significant compared to you know no treatment at all. Mm -hmm. So there are treatments that way as far as medications are concerned. Mm -hmm. But outside of medications, there's a lot of psychotherapeutic um, um, options that are available, and that can be you know uh, twelve step processes, mm -hmm. uh, smart recovery, um, seeing uh, being in therapy, uh, being uh, being with an addiction medicine specialist, mm -hmm. you know things like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when you talk about methamphetamines too. The the addictive nature of it is unlike things we've seen before, um, and it really comes down to the pharmacology of it. It spins up the amount of dopamine released in your brain to a degree far more than other stimulants like cocaine, mm -hmm. far more than opioids, far more than anything we could emulate on a non-pharmacological uh, basis. And so once a brain is exposed to levels of dopamine that high, um, it's, ve it's very uh, incredibly habit for me. Um, the only other treatment that I would point out, as um, Dr. Vivek uh, accurately said, there's no FDA approved treatment. The other area that's shown some degree of success is, is a concept called contingency management. Right. And that's essentially a, a, a psychosocial construct that rewards patients through various degrees of uh, motivational praise and sometimes financial benefits and assistance with social determinants of health for taking active steps. It, it almost, you can think of it as a way of gamifying sobriety. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's an area in conjunction with concepts such as harm reduction, which is realizing that relapse is incredibly common. And instead of um, coming down on someone who's relapsed or in some way be punitive, you, stand, you look at the pattern of relapse and say, okay, there's been X number of relapses over the last quarter. This is an improvement as opposed to before, because we need to again, put it in context. Remember other diseases, if you're a diabetic, very often you will have periods of high blood sugars. If you're mm -hmm. fighting obesity, very often you will cheat on your diet. If you have high blood pressure, very often you will forget to take your medicines. It's the same kind of thing mm -hmm. with someone who has stimulant use disorder with methamphetamines. We need to, instead of considering a relapse, some sort of failure and it's over, we need to take it in context from, with previous um, patterns and you aim to decrease the the frequency and decrease um, the, the dangers of each relapse. Yeah, great. Um, we had another caller ask, is there a prescription that can help lessen the urge to drink? So let's talk about pharmacotherapy for alcohol use disorders. Yeah, Vivek. yeah. so there are actually a couple of medications, actually three medications which are FDA approved for alcohol use disorder. Uh, two out of those three uh, actually do help with cravings and mm -hmm. uh, and you know reducing heavy number of drinking or binge drinking or mm -hmm. drinking days in particular. Uh, naltrexone is one of them, mm -hmm. uh, which which sort of works on the basis that you know when, when people drink alcohol, there's release of little uh, molecules in the brain which are like uh, endogenous opioids, mm -hmm. and they uh, just have this feeling of uh, of sort of you know feeling good, mm -hmm. and that's like aha, you know this is what I was wanting. Uh, to get from alcohol. Mm -hmm. Naltrexone blocks the activity of those little chemicals. So when the person drinks, they are not able to experience that, mm -hmm. that buzz. Uh, and that is how you know it just leads over time to less drinking. Mm -hmm. Initially, starting off with less heavy drinking and less heavy drinking days, and then eventually, you know, uh, goes on uh, to less and less drinking. Yeah. Uh, and then another medication is called acamprosate, and that also works on certain neurotransmitters in the brain, particularly glutamate. So mm -hmm. it sort of modulates that, uh, it particularly in the context of after uh, the detoxification, so you know, post-acute withdrawal, mm -hmm. when people are experiencing a lot of moodiness, mm -hmm. a lot of anxiety, a lot of sleep problems, so acamprosate has a role there. Mm -hmm. And by curbing uh, those, uh, you know, faulty neurotransmissions, it helps out uh, with you know cutting down the cravings mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, and leads to better outcomes over time. Yeah. Now, besides this, there are some other treatments which are also available, but they're not FDA approved and but commonly used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I prescribe some naltrexone, and I've yeah. had patients tell me, you know, Doc, this was amazing. I drank a beer, and mm -hmm. normally I would have gone on to drink twelve more, but I just didn't want yeah. to. Yeah. Is that would that be that, a typical that is reaction? Absolutely yes. Yeah. 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 Do you have anything to add to that, Stephen? 
just that they're very commonly underused. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's probably because people, especially providers, um, they, they might not keep up with the most recent addiction literature, mm -hmm. not their area. But if someone has alcohol use disorder, they really should be on one of these medications the same way as if someone has heart failure, they should be on something for that. And mm -hmm. so I think if we got to the point where um, it was just a routine screening mm -hmm. in primary care, and it's like, okay, you have some form of hazardous drinking or some form of alcohol use disorder, um, you should be on that. And if, if any of the listeners have issues with alcohol or they're concerned about it, they shouldn't be afraid to ask their primary care doctor. These meds are cheap. They're not, um, they're not like miracles, but they help. And mm -hmm. the data shows that it does decrease, uh, it does decrease consumption and, and that has tremendous benefit. Yeah, and to sort of just put that in perspective, only nine out of 100 people get offered treatments like right. naltrexone. So yeah. there's are more than 90% who are without treatment and, and going through the struggles without any you know, evidence-based help. Yeah, um, good. This is an interesting question. We got a question by email. Does the new class of drugs being used for weight loss, so I'm gonna assume we're talking about GLP-1 medications like Ozempic, amiglutide, have any effect on the parts of the brain responsible for food addiction like they help with um, problematic eating? Are you aware of any research there, Stephen? I've, I've read, um, I would say I've done headline reviews for that. Mm. Um, I, I suspect, and um, I won't say with certainty, but I suspect that they do, mm -hmm. um, because they have the same sort of um, feedback mechanisms. Um, and and, and, and many, because remember, um, an original diet drug, Concrave, actually used mm -hmm. naltrexone to some right. degree as well. And so it's the same kind of concept. So as time goes on, I suspect we will discover that they, they do have uh, benefit in this regard, but I would advise a bit of caution that we really don't know at this point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not aware of any particular mm -hmm. studies looking at eating disorders, or, uh, but you know, there's plenty of studies regarding obesity mm -hmm. and, uh, and weight loss. Uh, I mean, my reading of the literature is that there's you know, slowing of your, uh, of your GI motility, so you know, mm -hmm. food is moving slowly, and that sort of uh, you know, helps with, you know, uh, with your satiety centers mm -hmm. and you're not feeling hungry that way mm -hmm. because you, food is not really actually moving like it would without these medications. So mm -hmm. that may have an effect, but I, I think it's mostly, mostly speculative at this time. Sure, great. Uh, changing gears, we have problem-solving courts, which are courts that give individuals a special opportunity to bypass prison and instead take part in a unique parole program. Prairie Doc reporter Sam Shower spoke to one such parolee and Judge Abby Howard to learn more about these opportunities for those that would otherwise serve time. Judge Abigail Howard is one of the magistrate judges for the Third Judicial Circuit in Brookings County and has handled many cases in drug courts and they are an intensive probation program in lieu of someone serving a penitentiary sentence. So someone commits a felony level offense, they would normally go through a sentencing at the circuit court level, and if they apply to one of these voluntary programs and are accepted, they are sentenced to a problem-solving court instead of going to prison. The problem-solving court is an 18-month probation period with random testing of drugs and alcohol weekly meetings with a probation officer, and intensive treatment, among other requirements. And if they successfully complete all the requirements, get through the whole program, they're considered a graduate, and at the end they're discharged from probation uh, and hopefully have obtained a, a pretty significant chunk of sobriety and really changed the trajectory of their life. Gordon Opatz took the problem-solving court program when his sentencing loomed over a year ago. I got it suggested to me by a number of people prior to my sentencing and they all thought that I would be a pretty good candidate for it. And so it was kind of just a kind of a luck of a draw type thing. When Opatz first started the program, he shared that he was happy when he exercised and ran. He soon started running and based it on a challenge to run a number of miles for veteran suicide awareness. He thanks David Goggins for the motivation to run. Listening to a lot of David Goggins kind of got me off the couch and started to run. And so I jokingly said, wow, if you stick with running, uh, I'll run a 5K with you. That sounds great. And I just I got to quit promising these things. <laughs> with that, Recovery Runners was born. They set their first run for the Jack's 15 Road Race, which wasn't a 5K, 
but a 15 mile run. Gordon ran the whole 15 mile race, the whole thing. We had a group of participants, five participants ran the three miles each. And then we had a group of team members or professionals that also ran uh, three miles each. They ran back in September and Judge Howard hopes that recovery runners will continue in the future to help motivate and show exercise and recovery can go together. So I do think there's a lot of potential for it to continue on, to grow, uh, either with Gordon, with the current team, with future participants. That's our hope that we keep motivating this concept of how beneficial uh, physical activity and recovery can be. Great segment. I saw that group at that race. It was really cool to see them running together. Um, we have a lot of questions, so we'll try to get through most of these um, before the end of the show. Uh, let's start with, we had an email, and this is a challenging one. How do you tell someone they're an alcoholic? Um, I, let's assume this is maybe from the perspective of a family member struggling to help their loved one get help. How do you counsel family members through some of these difficult questions, Vivek? Right, so you know, I mean, so I usually ask them open-ended questions, mm -hmm. uh, and they usually elaborate on how alcohol has been impacting their lives. So it's impacting their lives, it's impacting the people who are around them. Mm -hmm. And and I actually, instead of telling them that they have alcohol use disorder, by the time, you know, I, I ask all those questions about, you know, uh, their social life, interpersonal relationships, uh, occupational life, you know, mm -hmm. home life, um, psychological impacts, physical impacts. I think that, that just, they themselves start realizing that alcohol has become a problem. But in some cases, you know, they already know that they have an alcohol problem. Mm -hmm. They just don't want to admit it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but uh, I think with, uh, with, you know, warmth and compassion and, uh, uh, and acceptance, uh, they do uh, admit to the diagnoses and seek help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. We had a, a few, um, questions kind of about the process of treatment. So let's start with this one. What does detox mean when you go to treatment? So you talked a little bit about detox in inpatient treatment. Right. So tell us what, right. what you mean by that. So detoxification is a process where the person is not consuming or using the substance that they are used to using. Mm -hmm. And when they're not using that substance, they are going to go through withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So to help them with the withdrawal process, the medications or therapies that are utilized are a part of detoxification. That can be medicine, that can be um, supportive treatment, mm -hmm. uh, that can be more rest, uh, that can be, you know, making sure that uh, they're taking, that their needs like, you know, hydration and mm -hmm. other medical illnesses are taken care of. That all of that com uh, comes under medical detoxification. Got it. And so withdrawal, what that looks like depends on what substance Absolutely. a patient's withdrawing from. What's a typical opioid withdrawal syndrome look like? What kind of symptoms will people have, Stephen? There are several time frames in duration to withdrawal. Um, you know, in, initially we use a scoring method. Um, it's called the COWS scoring method. And so that has everything from an elevated heart rate, your skin becomes, um, you know, the hairs on, on your skin stand up, you can sweat, you become agitated, things of this nature. Um, and then over time, several steps in between, but unfortunately it goes for quite some time where you actually end up feeling things like depression, long-term uh, brain chemistry changes. So um, the acute withdrawal process is, is more like a, the sickness symptoms I described, but the withdrawal in the sense of what people would think of as lingering effects, it actually becomes much more psychological as time mm -hmm. goes on. Mm -hmm. And you know, a common withdrawal symptom that we see everywhere is alcohol withdrawal, which I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think everybody knows is actually very dangerous mm -hmm. to go through without some medical supervision in Absolutely. some cases. Can you talk about so, that? So yeah, alcohol, alcohol uh, withdrawal is associated with mortality. So mm -hmm. people can actually die mm -hmm. uh, or they can have you know, other long-standing uh, concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, so a, a typical alcohol withdrawal usually lasts like four to five days. Mm -hmm. It starts after like six to nine hours of your last drink. And uh, most times you know, folks are feeling warm, they're sweaty, uh, their anxiety levels are high. Um, they're nauseous, they're vomiting, they're tremulous, so, you know, they're, they have these shakes and um, agitated, mm -hmm. uh, fairly irritable, 
uh, very short, you know, when I interview them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sometimes it can be bad and, and so severe that people start hallucinating mm -hmm. uh, and they start seeing things which aren't there. Uh, things appear louder to them when they hear things or they start hearing things which aren't there. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, they start feeling things on their skin and body uh, and they can even get confused. Mm -hmm. Now confusion can lead to other long-standing brain problems which are, right. you know, uh, neurocognitive disorders over time. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, managing alcohol detox withdrawal is very important mm -hmm. because when it, once it goes out of hand, it can cause uh, long-standing problems. Yeah, so a, a perfectly good reason to be in a hospital or an inpatient Absolutely. setting. Yeah. Um, don't be afraid to seek care for that. Um, let's see, what, what types of facilities does South Dakota have for those struggling with addiction? Um, and so it, we talked a little bit before the show that a lot of these are really centered in our two bigger urban areas, probably Sioux Falls and Rapid City with lower intensity, maybe options in smaller communities. But right. um, can you can you talk about what's available in Rapid City um, to start, Stephen? Sure, so there's a, a few kind of base nomenclatures to consider. So the American Society of Addiction Medicine, so-called ASAM, they classify recovery centers based on a, a number system from 0.5 to four, four being the most like medically intense recovery. So if someone mm -hmm. was in serious withdrawal from alcohol, they would need to go to an ICU kind of setting and, or you mm -hmm. know, a hospital floor kind of setting, that'd be like a 4.0. And then like your outpatient stuff is like a, a 0.5. And so South Dakota, you can go on the Division of Behavioral Health website and they'll actually have a list mm -hmm. of the various treatment centers. And so they are scattered all out. Many of their, they all kind of have different philosophies, but most of them prescribe to this form of uh, uh, of nomenclature. So, for example, in our city, um, we, have, we have a care campus, of course, which has several beds at the 3.1 level, so that is a residential sort of thing. Sturgis, um, which is Compass Point, has a 3.7 for more significant um, issues. Uh, gosh, I don't want to forget anybody, but there's others that mm -hmm. are around our, our area that, and so many times we'll send people to Yankton if, if they need a, you know, a, a certain setting. And Nevera, of course, has, a, I believe, a mm -hmm. 3.7 and a 3.1, if I'm not mistaken. So. Um, but the division's website, I believe, has this laid out pretty well. Great, it's a good resource then. Um, do you recommend patients try AA or NA? So what are these programs, Alcohol um, Anonymous and um, right. Narcotics Anonymous, and yeah. is, are they for everyone? Should we be sending everyone yeah, to those so programs? These 12-step facilitation mm -hmm. programs, like you know, commonly known as uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and there's multiple more, you know, Methamphetamine Anonymous, mm -hmm. Cannabis Anonymous, and uh, so they uh, align with uh, spirituality and you know, social uh, social networking, coping strategies, and essentially there's 12 steps. Mm -hmm. So you are submitting to a higher power, so there's a lot of spirituality aspect to mm -hmm. it. So it's more suitable for folks who are spiritually inclined. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can have a sponsor there uh, who can help you guide, advise, and you know, uh, and help out with coping strategies to stay in recovery over time. Uh, the biggest uh, good, the good thing about 12-step uh, processes or AA or NA is that they're free of cost. Mm -hmm. They're free of cost, they're available at a lot of places, they can be tailored to your needs, uh, you can investigate, um, find out which one works out for you and go there. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in regards with efficacy, you know, it does help uh, considerably. Mm -hmm. So there's some research showing that 12-step uh, facilitation uh, programs uh, can be as good or even better than other treatments like motivational enhancement, mm -hmm. CBT type programs. Uh, so it is very useful mm -hmm. uh, when, uh, when used judiciously. Okay, great. Um, we've got a handful more questions in just a few minutes, so we'll see if we can get through all of these. Um, we had a caller ask, do insurance rates get affected by seeing an addiction specialist doctor and could it cause an increase in rates? Um, Stephen, is that something that you've encountered? Um, maybe just another reason that patients might view this as, as, as a barrier, a stigma to seeking care? I won't speak universally for all yeah. of the insurance industry, but I will say that generally it's the opposite, mm. especially CMS, Medicaid, they go out of their way to cover addiction services. And I believe that's largely true for commercial insurance as well. Yeah, great. Um, we had a caller, Vivek, ask if antidepressants can be used to help with grief and trauma when related to addiction, and if so, 
can those substances become addictive? Does a, does a patient need to worry about that? So I guess, I yeah. mean, we, there's a lot of crossover right. between things Absolutely. like depression yeah. Yeah. and substance use disorders. Yeah. So. so like we previously discussed, you know, so 40 to 60 percent of, uh, of addiction or substance use disorders, there's a genetic transmission to that. Mm -hmm. The rest uh, is attributable to trauma. Mm -hmm. So usually, you know, traumatic situations that mm -hmm. people went through uh, as a child or, you know, adverse childhood experiences or as a grown-up. Mm -hmm. And the trauma leads to uh, changes on their genetic makeup, uh, which manifest into problems. So now there are medications available uh, because trauma, depression, all sort of are interrelated. And uh, so there are medications available to treat that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that is the best way uh, to treat uh, such uh, comorbid addictive disorders when you know addiction uh, co-occurs with psychiatric disorders. So you treat addiction and you also treat the psychiatric mm -hmm. illness. Uh, now, if you treat the psychiatric illness, it does lead to better outcomes with substance use and vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in regards with those medications being addictive, uh, there is no evidence to state that uh, right. that you know some of, that those medications are addictive. Yeah. Yeah. Great. You have anything to add, Stephen? You know, I, I think that's very important. Um, comorbid depression and anxiety are super common, mm -hmm. and you want to take every every option you can. So, you know, basic. Uh, mental health drugs um, in conjunction with addiction treatment is in going to increase your odds of success a lot. Great. Um, we had a question about gambling. Can you talk about gambling addiction in South Dakota? Um, I know people that deal with as a major issue in in their lives. We had an email question. So do you do you see that in your clinic? Um, I have, I see it very rarely. Yeah. Uh, and and the reason there is, you know, people do not think that they have a gambling mm -hmm. uh, gambling disorder until and unless you know they're uh, sort of coerced into treatment by a family member. Mm -hmm. uh, so gambling disorder works similarly, but here instead of using a substance, you're thriving on the, the lottery uh, mm -hmm. or the money that you win. And the person chases that and loses money and then goes back to win it again, mm -hmm. causing problems in all aspects of their life. So mm -hmm. it is real. I mean, it does mm -hmm. happen. I just don't see it as much because people don't seek treatment for it. Yeah, great. Um, Good. Well, we're in our la we're in our last thirty seconds. We had a caller ask, "What nonprofit organization is working to improve addiction care in South Dakota that you might recommend donating to and supporting?" So, do you have a plug for one or two things, Stephen? You know, when it comes to addiction treatment, um, I'll try to be brief here. I honestly feel that the dollars are best spent helping folks have some stability in their lives. So, I'm a Great. big fan of you know, Cornerstone Rescue Mission. I think while well, they don't directly treat addiction, they provide a degree of stability um, that is needed in order for someone to thrive in addiction treatment and similar organizations along that vein. Great, great. I, not to be biased, but you know, I would advocate for Emily's Hope and Avera Health because they are doing wonderful work for addiction Thank services. you very much. The winner of our prize tonight is Mary. Thank you, Mary, for asking a question during the first 20 minutes of the show. A gift will be sent to you. We'll be back after this. Searching for trusted medical information or looking for a doctor for your medical needs? Head to the Prairie Doc YouTube channel today to access previous On Call with the Prairie Doc episodes. And make sure to join us most Thursdays on SDPB or streaming on our Prairie Doc Facebook page. I've lost everything, but I just can't stop. Once I take that first drink, that is all I think about. I use to take the pain away. These are just some of the many things you might hear someone who struggles on a daily basis with an addiction say. Addiction is a chronic disease that can physically and mentally change a person from who they once were. When we hear the word addiction, we might automatically go to the person on the street looking to score their next fix. But these are people who struggle every minute of their day to make the unconscious choice to feed this compulsion without thinking of the consequences of what this might do to them or their family. Addiction doesn't pick and choose, have a type or have a criteria. So anyone from any gender, class, race, etc., can fall victim to this disorder. In my time at various jobs, I have heard addiction described as their own worst enemy, their best and only friend, or the one thing they wish they could take back from their life. Now don't forget that addiction doesn't just stop at substances. You will see a wide range including gambling, shopping, eating, and pornography 
And this is only just naming a few that can consume a person's every waking thought. As hopeless as addiction might feel, the good news is there is hope and recovery is possible. Now there might not be a cure for addiction, but with the right tools, you can certainly make positive changes to help maintain prolonged sobriety. Now I can sit here and say these words quite easily, but the road is far from that. These words are not said to discourage or make you scared, but to give a real perspective that it takes a lot of work, time, dedication, and change, but with that, recovery is possible. Whether you choose treatment, AA, NA, peer support groups, or taking recovery into your own hands, there are some core components that need to happen to gain a better chance of being successful. You can start doing this by surrounding yourself with positive support, changing your playgrounds by not frequenting the same places, gaining healthy coping skills, and taking it one day at a time. To finish, I always tell my patients, make sure you are addressing your mental health as well as your substance use. A beautiful life is waiting for you, but you just need to take that first step in admitting to yourself you have a problem and asking for help. Thank you to our guests, Dr. Anand and Dr. Tamang, for volunteering their time to help us learn more about addiction and recovery. If you would like to see and hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, or visit us at prairiedoc.org. Look for Prairie Doc Perspectives in your local newspaper and online. Listen to us live every Wednesday morning at 9.30 on KBRK Brookings. And be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever podcasts can be found. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, thanks for joining us for another episode of health information based on science, built on trust. And until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Good dental health is about more than just avoiding cavities. The condition of your mouth is often called a window to your general health, as it is closely tied to your overall well-being. Dental health, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Hi, my name is Ken Bartholomew, and I'm a member of the Healing Words Foundation. Well, I'm a family practitioner, 45 years uh, in practice now, and uh, practiced in Falcon for 14 years and then moved to Pierre but I've been going back to Falcon for the last 30 years, uh, once a week to help out up there and practice up there too. Where else can you get free, non-biased medical education? And I stress that because it's non-biased. We don't take advertising. There's no drug company interference or pressure there. And it's uh, all science-based. It gives people information on anywhere from neurology to urology, to GI, cardiology. They can get all kinds of information without having to travel, and it's free. Well, they're gonna get a wealth of information on just about every topic throughout the year. We, we cover a little of everything throughout the year. A lot of people have benefited directly. They've, they've told me personally, they've directly benefited by the information they got on this program. For more information or to donate, head to www.prairiedoc.org or you can send your donations to P.O. Box 752, Brookings, South Dakota 57006. And thank you for your support. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... At Avera, our nationally recognized health system will be right here with you, with care and coverage. Hello possibility. Hello healthy. Hello life. Avera, moving health forward. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Ophthalmology Limited, 
Avera Medical Group Brookings, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Monument Health, Dakota Dermatology, Vance Thompson Vision, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, Peer District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yenton District Medical Society, Orthopedic Institute, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, South Dakota American College of Physicians, Cool Beans Coffee, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, and Swiftel Communications.